I'll finish, uh, begin by finishing this, uh, this cliffhanger proof. <laughs> uh, so essentially, the argument is here already. So, uh, so we want to, so I should just explain how one can evaluate these and why they work out to give you this right power of log in, uh, for the lower bound. So let's look at the, let's look at the uh, left hand side first. So I can expand out a chi d to the k minus 1. It'll be a sum over uh, numbers up to, so, so a chi d goes up to, the sum over n goes up to x. So if I multiply k minus 1 of them, the sum goes up to x to the k minus 1. Some kind of function, uh, which is like a divisor function, let's call it dk minus 1 of nx over root n, uh, chi d n. And this function, let's just say, it's the number of ways of writing n as a1, the product of a1 to ak, where the aj are at most x. So, so now if I use this uh, use a formula that we know that we can evaluate the first moment plus a little bit, uh, so I can compute that the number of the sum over discriminants up to x. that this behaves like, so this is asymptotic to uh, some constants which, we can, which we'll forget. Uh, there's a sum over this n going up to x to the k minus 1. Over root n. And then let's write n as uh, n1 times n2 squared maybe, where n1 is square free, and then I get uh, from the formula that uh, we still have as the answer. So we get something like 1 over root n1, well, x times this, log of root x over n1. <coughs> now, to get this, uh, upper this uh, a lower bound for the kth moment, I only need a lower bound for this quantity. Everything is positive, so I can just focus on whatever terms that I want. and. Uh, and not worry about some terms that I want, that I don't have to worry about. So this is, let's say, at least big, as big as log x. So this is at least some x times log x. And let's just worry about n that's less than, than x, so that I don't have to worry about what dk minus 1 of nx is. It's just dk minus 1 of n. So it's at least as large as n up to x, uh, dk minus 1 of n. And then it's going to be divided by and n1 times n2. This is the square root of n1, n2, and that's the square root of n1. OK, so and this is essentially a multiplicative function. So let's, uh, so, well, it is a multiplicative function. But what I mean is that I can split the n1 and the n2 squares. So you can see that this kind of roughly looks like x log x, a sum over, let's say, n1 goes up to maybe root x. Uh, dk minus 1 of n1 over n1. And then the n2 terms have a dk minus 1 of n2 squared over n2. This is not strictly speaking correct because n1 and n2 can have something in common, but that's a very minor, minor nuisance. And then it's a simple matter to evaluate these. Uh, the first term would give me something like x log little x to the k minus 1. And then the second one, you can again work out what the, what the power of log should be. Uh, dk minus 1 of p squared, that's the important thing to, to calculate. And that's uh, k minus 1 times k over 2. So the power of log will be, will be this, this, this exponent here. So it's k times k minus 1 over 2. And little x is a small power of capital X, maybe x, of, x to the 1 over 100k. And so all of this, if I forget the dependency on k, is as large as x log x to the, uh, this is a log x to the k. So you see this k times k plus 1 over 2, which is, uh, which is what, we what we wanted. And then I have to do the same calculation for, for, this, for the second sum. Yep, 
to x. And uh, again, this is not so bad. This is uh, sum over fundamental discriminants up to x. And then I have a sum n up to x to the k, dk and x over root n. And once again, if I interchange the sum over d and the sum over n, only the square values of n will survive, and everything else will disappear. So this will be bounded by, you can check, uh, maybe n squared less, where I just use that this function is at most as large as the k divisor function. Okay, and uh, once again, this is bounded by x log x to the k times k plus one over two. So in other words, what we, what, all we are saying is that the, the L function L half chi d, it doesn't really look like this uh, approximation A chi d, which is, truncate, which is a very short truncation of the, of the Dirichlet series defining L, but at least as far as the size of the objects are concerned, they more or less have the same size. And so when, the, what I, when I'm using holders inequality, there's really no loss in using holders inequality in this, in this setting. So this gives the, the correct lower bound. Okay, now one can make uh, some refinements to this argument. Uh, so I said you can also prove the same kind of result if, uh, if k is a rational number bigger than one. So let's say you can write k as r over s. Uh, bigger than one. So, so here the trick is, well, so, so the trick in this was, uh, was to set up holders inequality in a way such that you only have to evaluate integer powers of some Dirichlet polynomial. Evaluating a fractional power is hard, but, a, but an integer power you could always expand it out and then interchange sums and, do, and play around with it. So we want to do something similar here. And the idea is that, in, so, I don't want to now take this uh, a of chi d to the k because that's a fractional power of some Dirichlet series which I don't know how to handle. But it would be nice if, if a of chi d, this itself were some power of some other Dirichlet polynomial, right? If that, if that were a, then that raised to the k would just be b of some chi d to the, some power r. So, and again, that would be some integer power of a Dirichlet polynomial, and I can handle everything and everything exactly like, like so. So, now, these coefficients were easy to understand what they were. They were just the coefficients 1, chi d n over root n. So I need to figure out what would be something that I put in here, which, when I take the s power, kind of looks like, uh, like 1. And that's easy. I should just choose the coefficients of zeta of s to the 1 over... Well, s is a bad variable. Okay, so zeta of z to the one over s, and that would be d one over s n over n to the z, the one over s the divisor function. So, so that's all you have to do. So you define b of chi d to be the sum d one over s n over root n chi d n. n goes up to some a uh, very small power of, power of capital X, and then expand, and then play around with, with the sum of uh, L half chi d, uh, B of chi d to the S to the K minus one, still an integer power of some Dirichlet polynomial, and this is bounded by the sum of L to the k, to the, and this again is an integer power of a Dirichlet polynomial, and everything goes through. So now you can look at, uh, you can see 
the one thing that I that I have to worry about here is that the how is how large should x be? Well, this whole thing should be a small Dirichlet polynomial, and the and the size of it is it's b of chi d to the power k times s, which is the same as r. So I really want that this little x should be taken to be a small power of of capital X, but something like 1 over 100 R, rather than just 1 over 100 K, right? So, so now you can see that there's a small problem because even if this number K is very close to 1, but if, you're, if your K is, happens to be 101 over 100, it actually is, you need to choose a much smaller value of X than you could for K equals 1 or K equals 2. So in other words, when you carry out this argument, you get a lower bound of the right order of magnitude, but the lower bound will depend upon k, and it'll depend upon the height of k rather than just on what the value of k is. So, okay. So, so I'll describe uh, very briefly uh, the uh, result due to uh, Maxime Rajivel and me, which fixes this and gives you uh, a bound which is continuous in K. So, so already for zeta, this is uh, this was new, and so let me state it just for zeta that I would get something like uh, completely explicitly maybe for large t, you get something like x of minus. Some, some dependence on k, t log t to the k squared. The right power on k squared, k should be like e to the minus k squared rather than k to the four. Okay, so this is for all real k at least one. So the proof of this is, uh, uh, I kind of like this proof because it's like a nice joke. Uh, you, can, you can use this uh, thing called the Sylvester sequence to write one as a, so you can write one as one half plus one third plus one seventh plus so on, where at each stage you multiply all the previous fractions and add one. So, so this is a very rapidly increasing sequence that sums up to one. So let me get the, so I'm going to call this 1 over b1. You don't have to use this, but it's kind of fun to use this. And then let's uh, do the same thing for uh, 1 minus 1 over k. I'm going to write down some sequence of natural numbers whose reciprocals add to, add to that. And again, do this in a greedy way. So choose the, the, the largest number you can do, and then the next largest and so on. So, so this, this sequence of numbers, the aj and the bj, will increase very rapidly. Like think of the Sylvester sequence where you're multiplying all the previous numbers and adding one. That increases certainly fa much faster than exponential. Okay, so now the idea is going to be that uh, uh, that we're going to use we're going to use uh, some versions of these uh, of these functions b of chi d b of uh, b for the zeta function, uh, taking shorter and shorter things, but for but for these uh, parameters b aj's and the bj's. Okay, so I'll explain how that works. Okay, so I'm going to start with uh, 
the integral of zeta of half plus i t, and then a product over all uh, L goes from 1 to infinity. Uh, so I'll call this A sub L of half plus i t, and then a product over all L from 1 to infinity, B sub L of half minus i t. And A sub L of S is going to be the sum of D of K over uh, A L of N over N to the S. N goes up to some small power of T, T to the 1 over 100 A L. And then this B sub L of half minus I T is going to be a sum of D K over B L of N over n to the s. And again, this n goes up to some very small power of t. So the idea is that, is that this is kind of a stand-in for uh, zeta of s to the k over a l. And this is a stand-in for, uh, well, so here for zeta of half minus i t to the k over a l, sorry, b l, right? So, so when I multiply all of these powers of zeta out, this, this guy is a stand-in for zeta of s, the whole product is a stand-in for zeta of half minus i t to the k, and this whole product is like an approximation to zeta of half plus i t to the k minus one. So, so if, that, if that intuition is correct, then what I've written down is kind of like a proxy for zeta of s to the 2k. But on the other hand, okay, but on the other hand, these are all short Dirichlet polynomials. So let me explain, so, because each of the n's here only goes up to t to the one over 100 al. So when you multiply all of them out, it still goes up only up to t to the one over 100, and the same up to here. So these are two short Dirichlet polynomials that are being multiplied out. And then you can use uh, Holder's inequality uh, to say that this is bounded by zeta to the 2k, to the 1 over 2k. And then I think here you just get mod the product of over all L, product of, of mod AL of half plus it to the uh, 2AL. BL. You can see, if you don't believe this inequality, at least check that the exponents add up to one. So this is a one over 2K. The sum of one over 2AL adds up to one minus one over k, so those two things add up to a half, and the sum of the one over two bls adds up to another half. So, it's, so that inequality is correct. And then you can, you can again evaluate everything in sight because this is a zeta function multiplied by two short Dirichlet polynomials, and this is a short Dirichlet polynomial, and that's a short Dirichlet polynomial. So everything can be evaluated, and And it gives you a lower bound for the 2 kth moment of zeta, which I claim depends only as uh, uh, only depends on the parameter k and doesn't depend upon any rational approximations to k. So, so let me just uh, maybe roughly explain why that particular result is true. The okay, I don't want to say this very. Uh, in much detail, but the, the, the point is that, okay, so, so if you, when you're thinking of uh, the sum of uh, uh, n up to t to the one over 100 al, so, so one of these integrals, let's say, so, 
when you expand things like this out, you, you should, you know, like I think our AK type contribution was coming from this dk n squared over n, n going up to some, up to some point. Like if it goes up to t, you get this constant times t log t to the k squared. The fact that you're truncating at something like t to the 1 over 100 al might roughly mean that when you carry out some expansion like this, you might lose something and have only those terms with n going up to some small power of, of t. But what's the loss in doing this? This would be asymptotic to something like a, a log t to the k squared with the usual constant a k. But then divided by, well, instead of going up to t, you're only going up to t to the 1 over 100 al, so something like 100 al to the k squared. So in other words, you, you lose some constant, which is going to be some power of, some fixed power of this al. Okay? So we've certainly lost something by doing this truncation. But on the other hand, I'm not losing that to the power 1. I'm losing it only to the power 1 over 2 al. So, so, I, so I have some loss, but this loss is really going to be only this number to the 1 over 2 al. So in other words, what I've lost is not really al, but like al to the k squared over al. So the loss is like or 100 al to but that's okay, because these ALs are rapidly increasing. So when I multiply them over all L, I only lose a constant. So when I take the product of this, it's still about most. I don't lose by more than a constant factor. So in other words, when you, when you expand this out, the upper bounds that we get for, for this quantity is only off by a constant from the upper bound for dkn squared over n. And the same thing with the lower bounds for this, I lose only a constant. Um, and that, that means that you get a lower bound, which is uniform in k. Okay? So, so, so this is an idea which is uh, in some ways related to the sieve. It's also going to be an idea that I'll explain in, in work on, on the upper bounds, which I'll talk about next. And uh, you should really think of it as, uh, so maybe I'll try to make this analogy with the sieve more clear as well. You should think of it as, if you have to sieve some number of primes, it's the initial primes that make the biggest contribution. So you want to be able to sieve the initial primes really well, and then the, the primes which are further and further out, you don't have to work so hard to sieve them because they make progressively smaller contributions. So the small values of n we kind of get, you know, with, with a big weight like d of k over 2 of n. Over, over n to the s, we get them out of the way. We take a long, long sum. But for other ones, we have to shave, you know, we, they contribute progressively less, so we can truncate the argument uh, at, uh, in a shorter way. OK. So, so the situations for, for lower bounds of L functions uh, is pretty well understood, except for one final point, which is that uh, these arguments tell you that if I, can know, if I know something like the first moment, then I get lower bounds for all the larger moments. So you, the one thing that's remaining is what happens for lower bounds for small moments. So for example, the, the argument that I gave you for, uh, let's say, let's look at it now for Dirichlet characters. You could look at L half to the chi to the 2k over all chi mod q. Let's say primitive. Uh, then the argument that I gave you would show that if k is at least 1, so you start by saying something about the second moment here. And then it would say that if k is at least 1, then we have the right. Uh, right lower bounds.
So, but what happens if k is uh, less than one? So in general, we actually don't have good lower bounds for moments in the small, in the small ranges. So, but this is one example in which we do have good lower bounds, which were worked out by uh, Chandi and Lee. Uh, obtain the right so they carried it out I think when k is a rational number but you can then also incorporate what Max and I did and then probably get the right result for all real values between 0 and 1 so this seems like a kind of a technical thing so I should say that it actually is a, I think an important question so let me give you an example of something where we would like to be able to prove a result like this, but we don't know. Uh, let's fix a modular form f, and let's look at the family of quadratic twists of it. Now let's say f twisted by chi d. And it would be very nice to give lower bounds for this. So we know this lower bound for k larger than 1. And it would be very nice to give the same lower bounds when k is less than 1. And uh, the reason I say this is that, <coughs> is that suppose you had the, the right lower bound even for small values of k. Then you can imagine letting k go, into, go to 0. If you let k go to 0, then this function is just picking up essentially 1 if the L value is not 0 and it's picking up 0 if the L value is 0. So if you have the right lower bound as, as k goes to 0, you would know that a positive proportion of these L values are not 0. So this would imply, so if this is true for small values of k, then it would imply, uh, this conjecture would imply, would imply a positive proportion of Or non-zero. So it's uh, it's expected that that this value, this L value, can be zero essentially only when the sine of the functional equation is zero. So that happens 50% of the time, and 50% of the time the sine of the functional equation is plus one, and we expect that most of the time in that case it's non-zero. But we don't even know that a positive proportion of, of such values are, are non-zero. But uh, well, these two, the problem of non-vanishing and the problem of these small moments are quite closely related. Uh, the way you prove non-vanishing results is to do something called the modifier method and be able to compute the first and the second moment. And, then, and, and if you can add something called a modifier, then you would be able to prove non-vanishing results. We can do that in the case of, of uh, all Dirichlet characters, and this is what underlies the work of Chandi and Lee, is that essentially they're using a kind of a version of a modifier to get lower bounds for, for small moments, which we don't have in this, uh, in this situation. Okay, but apart from this very small moment, uh, the story for lower bounds is pretty well understood. Okay, so now for the last part, I want to talk about uh, upper bounds for these moments. And, and also connections to, uh, to, to the central limit theorem of Selberg that I already mentioned. So maybe to think about this, let me uh, tell you one more way to think about why we get the various powers of log in the in the in these moment conjectures that we are supposed to get that we are supposed to get. So let me start with uh, with uh, recalling Selberg's theorem that I mentioned yesterday. which says that if I, so it, recall that it says that if I look at 
the log of zeta of half plus i t, I can look at the real or the imaginary parts, but let me look at the real part here. And suppose t varies between uh, twice capital T, t and quite twice capital T, that in this range, this is approximately Gaussian, with mean zero and variance uh, half log log t. And what this means is that, okay, so let's, uh, let me write it down. So this means that if I fix any number v in R, then as t goes to infinity, the measure of uh, of values t for which uh, log zeta half plus i t is bigger than v times the square root of the variance that this tends to the Gaussian integral. So, okay. So this is a, the, the theorem as it as it stands is a theorem for fixed values of r of v and as t goes to infinity. Okay, and you can you can make it uniform in in certain ranges, but to to gain some insight, let's assume that this uh, this kind of uh, behavior persists for all values of v. So let's, uh, let's suppose that this is true for all the. This, of course, false. OK, so let me, uh, let me give you one reason why it's false. Uh, so, so Selberg's theorem would tell you something about maybe about uh, large values and small values. So you could imagine that v being very, very small, like uh, uh, maybe v going to minus infinity. And in this case, you shouldn't expect too much uniformity in which a, which a result like this can, tr can hold. Uh, because suppose you want to say that, there is, that you're making some claim about the frequency with which very small values of zeta occur. Right? There's one way in which you can produce small values of zeta. You take a zero, and you take a small neighborhood around a zero, and you'll get very small values. So if you take that, you will produce more small values than will be predicted by Selberg's theorem. So you should not, so you should not use Selberg's theorem in that range. So uh, not true for very small values of of zeta uh, near zeros. But maybe you can assume that. Let's say, suppose it's true for large values of zeta, or maybe it's true as an upper bound, so that you can get upper bounds for moments. So, so let, I'm going to normalize this as slightly differently. So let's say that, uh, suppose we assume that the measure of t and t to 2t uh, with zeta of half plus i t bigger than some number e to the v that this behaves uh, roughly like is bounded above by something like x puff minus v squared over log log t. OK, I'm being a little crude here. This is exactly the same as the integral that I wrote down, except for the slight normalization. I made it here e to the v instead of e to the v times the square root of the variance. And then you know, this, this integral is roughly like e to the minus v squared over 2. 
not exactly, but roughly the same as e to the minus b squared over 2. And then that's what I've written down here, again, if you take into account the normalization. So let's suppose that something like this is true. OK? So, like that. So, so if you know this, then you can immediately get a, an upper bound for moments. Okay? So this will imply a bound for moments. quite easily because what is the 2kth moment of, uh, of zeta? Well, it'll be the values on which this is larger than some number e to the v times the measure of the set on which it takes values that are as large. So this will be the integral from minus infinity to infinity e to the 2kv times the change in the measure of such large values. which you can integrate by parts to, to be able to use this bound. So this is essentially the same as uh, uh, oh, maybe this should have been with a minus sign, I think. Right? OK, because this is a decreasing function, right? Yeah. So OK, but then when you integrate by parts, you'll get uh, uh, two minus signs, which will cancel out. So now I can write down. So, okay, so now suppose you have a, a uniform upper bound for the measure on which zeta can be large. So then you would get that this is bounded by dv, and then you can just focus on what, what is the range of values of v on which uh, this is as large as possible. Okay. That's a simple calculus exercise, and you can see that this is maximized when, when v is about uh, k log log t. And, uh, and for this value of, uh, of v, this, this integral is roughly of size uh, t log t to the k squared. So in other words, uh, what the 2kth moment of zeta is picking out is, uh, so the 2kth moment is really picking out values of zeta of size uh, log t to the k. That's e to the v. And the set of values of zeta around size log to the t, uh, t to the k, log t to the k, this set has measure, which is about t over log t to the k squared. So therefore, if you take the 2kth moment of, of this, you get log t to the 2k squared times the measure, which is another 1 over log t to the k squared, which gives us the right bound. So you can see that there's a there is kind of a, an, an intimate connection between Selberg's theorem on, uh, on the value distribution of zeta of half plus it and these moment conjectures. And so you can ask, OK, so you can ask about the keating snaith conjectures, what would be the analog of some conjecture on the value distribution of, of the logarithms of L functions, which would produce, produce these exponents of uh, k times k plus 1 over 2, or k times k minus 1 over 2. And so these are conjectures that are due to uh, Keating and Snaith. Of Selberg's conjecture, Selberg's theorem. So let me take, uh, uh, let's suppose we take log of L half chi d, and we vary over fundamental discriminants d up to size x. And we want to know the distribution of this. Uh, you can see that this is already a, a more subtle problem than, than Selberg's theorem for zeta, because, well, OK, I looked at log zeta of half plus it. 
It could be that zeta of half plus it is zero, but it's zero only on a set of measures, measure zero, so I can ignore that in any statistical calculation that I want. Uh, here I have a problem because if I look at log of L half chi d, and L half chi d happens to be zero very often, then I don't get a distribution at all. Okay, I can't ignore these, these values. But we do conjecture that there are very few values of, uh, of, of d for which L half chi d is, is zero. In fact, we conjecture that there are no values of d for which any, any Dirichlet L function vanishes at half. So this is never expected to be zero. But if it is zero for a lot of times, then we have a problem. OK, so, so you can't, we can't prove that this is never zero or zero on a set of density one. So that's one reason why these analogs are not theorems, but just conjectures. But OK, but the conjecture is now quite nice. This is approximately normal. But now there's a slight difference with mean about, so instead of the mean being zero, the mean is about half log log x. And the variance is a little bit larger, it's log log x. So, so okay, so why is the variance larger? Well, the z log of zeta half plus it has a real part and an imaginary part. Both can be big, and therefore each of them becomes you know, of size roughly one over square root of two so that when you square them and add, they contribute 50-50 each. Uh, whereas this guy is always going to be a real number, and so therefore, you get this variance being slightly larger. I'll explain the mean in just a minute. Now, Sorry? This is a conjecture, yes, yeah. And similarly, one can conjecture, if you look at log of L half, uh, say, say fix a modular form F, an eigenform, and then look at L half F twisted by chi D. So here we should be careful not to look at it over all discriminants, but maybe over the fundamental discriminants up to X, for which the sign of the functional equation is positive. If the sign is negative, then these values are all zero, and, and there's no more to be said. Then this is uh, all, this also is a conjecture that this is approximately normal with mean minus half times log log x and variance log log x. So, okay, and then I, what I want to say is that if you f do the analog of the calculation that I did for the, for the zeta function, take the 2 kth moment in each one of these families and rewrite them in terms of values being of certain size v, and then use these two conjectures, you will produce exactly the exponents k times k plus one over two in the symplectic case of uh, quadratic Dirichlet characters, and k times k minus one over two in this case. And you can kind of see the, difference coming in the, in the mean, which is uh, small in one case, pointing in the negative direction, uh, where the powers of the, where the moments is, is smaller, k times k minus one over two, and large in the other case. Okay, so let me give you a, a, a kind of a, a heuristic explanation for where these central limit theorems come from, and then I'll state uh, some recent results on, uh, on these upper bounds for moments. So, so let's, uh, so maybe for, to start with, you can think of log zeta of half plus it. Well, let's forget this. Uh, you, can, you can more or less think of this as a sum over primes p of one over p to the half plus it. Uh, of course, this doesn't converge, but it's not, it's not very far from the truth. If you truncate it at some height, uh, height t, height uh, t, it's kind of a roughly a very good approximation. Or maybe let me truncate it at some height x. Uh, x is some power of t, t to the one over a, 
And then this is usually a good approximation up to error big O of A. This is not completely correct, but let's, you know, let's pretend that something like this is true. But it's, it's not completely correct for one more reason. Uh, if you take the log of the zeta function, it's not just a sum over primes, it's a sum over all the prime powers. It's a sum over uh, k p to the ks. So, so we have to worry about uh, the prime squares and the prime cubes and so on. The prime cubes and the prime to the fourths are all irrelevant because they are convergent Dirichlet series when I'm on the half line. But the prime square could still be slightly problematic. Maybe it would be something like a sum of one over p to the one plus two it in this case. In the zeta function case, it really doesn't uh, affect us very much. You can kind of say that this is never going to be, so it's a bit like the problem of L1 chi that I started out with. So, or the log of L1 chi, this is like a, essentially, almost surely this is convergent. And if you like, you can forget about forget about this contribution from the prime squares. So then you're left with trying to think about the sum over primes up to, up to x of p to the half plus it. And, uh, and here you want to make use of the fact that these p to the it's for different primes behave like independent random variables as t varies. Okay? So you can justify this uh, at least if, if x is not uh, very big compared to t then you can, for example, you can compute moments of this object. So if x is like t to the 1 over 100, then you can compute the first 100 moments of this. And you know that, you know how the distribution behaves. So if this behaves like a sum of independent random variables, then you can see that uh, the center limit theorem will apply to this object. Okay, so, so the idea would be that there is a center limit theorem for the sum of one over p to the half plus it, p going up to x. And so if the p to the it's are just behaving randomly, so they more or less uh, cancel out, and then you should compute the variance of it. So I should say that, okay, now if I want to do it properly for log mod zeta, I should take the real part here. So I should take the real part here and then compute compute the moments of this. So, okay, so this will, this will give a kind of a heuristic justification for Selberg's theorem. And you can make this precise in the T aspect because this initial approximation that I wrote down can actually be made precise if you're willing to average over T in a certain sense. So even though this could be zero and this would be minus infinity and then this formula doesn't make sense. It holds true in a sense of measure. But now imagine that, uh, let's uh, imagine that we can make the same argument for let's say log of uh, L half uh, chi d for quadratic Dirichlet characters. So in this case, I would try to formally write down something like a sum over p up to some point uh, one over chi d p over square root of p. But then I'll also have the sum over the prime squares. And then the prime cubes and so on are irrelevant as, as before. But you can see that now the prime square terms are actually determined explicitly. They behave, they're always equal to one. And the p goes up to I said here that it should go to some power of t, so maybe some power of x. But this grows like log log x to the 1 over a. And log log is growing so, is varying so slowly that it really doesn't matter where I truncate it, as long as it's some power of x. Uh, or even, it doesn't even have to be a power of x, it could be like x to the 1 over log log x or log log x squared, and it'll still be okay. And this doesn't change very much. So it's this feature that becomes the mean of the distribution, which is about half log log x. 
and then the contribution for the primes still behaves roughly randomly with the pluses and minuses taken equally often. So this should have a, a normal distribution. This part should be normal with mean zero and variance uh, about, the variance would be the sum of the reciprocals of the primes, which is about log log x. Again, because of, the, of this log log x feature, it doesn't matter where you truncate. As long as it's uh, remotely sensible, it will give you the same answer. Okay, so that's the Keating state conjecture for, for the family of quadratic Dirichlet L functions. And let me just explain the analog of this calculation for for the L functions of a, for quadratic twists of a, of a modular form. So if you write, if you write your modular form as a product over prime p, so, so alpha p and beta p uh, multiply out to one, and alpha p plus beta p is our coefficients a p. Then, if you if you if you do the analog of this calculation with log of l half f twisted by chi d. Okay, so you would have to evaluate uh, the logarithms of these quantities. So you'd get an alpha p over p to the half, and then a beta p over p to the half, and then alpha p squared plus beta p squared. So, so this would, formally it would look like a sum over p. The higher order terms which are irrelevant. So this again, we would expect, oh, so everything multiplied by a chi d p. And this would be multiplied by chi d p squared, which is just one. So again, these are some fixed numbers, whatever they are. Uh, these are the APs. But if you, if you, we would expect that this is uh, normal with mean zero, and the variance is going to be the sum of AP squared uh, over P, the squares of these. But by Rankine-Selberg, then this would be, if you truncate at any reasonable point, this would still be asymptotic to log log x. But if you now, if you look at this, uh, so you, you can check that alpha p squared plus beta p squared plus one would be the coefficients of the symmetric square L function attached to L. And that averages out to zero. This averages to zero. Which means that alpha p squared plus beta p squared averages to minus one, almost always. So this averages to minus half times log log x. And so the mean is uh, shifted in this example to something negative. Okay, so that, uh, those are the conjectures in these contexts. And what I've said is that if some uniform version of these conjectures were true, then you would get upper bounds of the right order of magnitude for moments in these, in these various examples. So let me end by saying uh, some results on, on upper bounds, which I'll uh, describe uh, tomorrow. So first there's a, so the principle for lower bounds was that if you can evaluate some moment plus a little bit, then you can get lower bounds for all the, all the higher moments. So there's a complementary principle which, uh, uh, Maxim and I have been working on recently is that if you, so let me state it roughly as if you know uh, some moment plus epsilon, then you can get uh, the correct upper bounds.
for all smaller moments. So I'll illustrate this by, by the theorem in the, in the, in the context of uh, quadratic twists of a modular form, or, or an elliptic curve, let's say. So here, here the only moment that we know how to calculate is the first. Is, uh, we know asymptotics for this. And it's the only moment that's known. say, unconditionally. And so what our work does is that it, from this, one can prove that you get the right upper bound for all smaller moments. Now, apart from this, we have pretty good results if we know uh, the Riemann hypothesis. This problem has now recently been fully understood if we, know, if we have RH. Uh, so some years back, I proved that on GRH, one gets one almost gets the right upper bound. So for example, you would get that the, I, that the 2kth moment of zeta, assuming Rh, would be bounded by t log t to the k squared plus epsilon for any, for any k. And uh, last year, there's uh, been a beautiful refinement of this by Harper. Uh, one gets exactly the sharp upper bound. T log t to the k squared without the epsilon. So in, in some ways, uh, we essentially understand the the size of, uh, of these moments. Uh, so well, let me give you maybe one more example of this result with, uh, with max. Uh, you could, one gets that zeta to the 2k is bounded by t log t to the k squared uh, for all k, k less than two, which was previously known if you assume the Riemann hypothesis, but this result is unconditional. So we have good lower bounds very often, and we also have good upper bounds essentially almost all the time, if you're willing to assume GRH. So Harper's result on GRH? Yes. Harper's result is on GRH, yeah. So GRH right. or just for the zeta? For zeta, but the, the idea would be that if you assume GRH, then for whatever family you're working with, you would get, you would get the corresponding result. Now, uh, and then the last thing that I, so I'll discuss these results tomorrow, along with uh, with one other refinement. I mentioned these keating snaith conjectures on uh, on log normality. Uh, part of this work with uh, with 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 Razival would also give you one-sided bounds towards these uh, towards these results. We can't prove we can prove an upper bound for the for the frequency of large values, which is exactly the conjectured upper bound, but we can't produce a corresponding lower bound. Thank you. Questions? So, say for Dirichlet, and for Fourier Dirichlet functions, the problem is that one cannot show that this approximation holds it often enough for the analog of the external limit theorem. Yeah, so, so for example, you know, I proved that seven-eighths of these L functions are not zero, right? But what if one-eighth of them were zero? Then there would be no theorem. But on RH, we know it, right? Yeah. No, you don't know that. Even on RH? Even on RH. On RH, seven-eighths would be replaced by 15 sixteenths, but not, but not one. 
right? So, okay, so there is work of uh, one result I could mention in that direction, which is due to Bob Huff, that if you assume the Riemann hypothesis and you also assume that there are no zeros which are very near the central point, uh, in the sense of density, that the, the number of times you get a zero very close to half is density zero, then you can prove the analog of Selberg's theorem. But you need more than RH. One remark is, in this conjecture, you implies Goldfeld's conjecture, right? Yes, right. So yeah. it's quite a strong conjecture, yeah. to say the least. Um, the other just a remark is that um, these terms where you're getting the main terms, where you get these positivity, this is what, it's exactly the same remark goes into this theorem of Goldfeld, where if you assume RH mm -hmm. and you mm -hmm. you want to explain it? It's kind of so the theorem that Andrew mentions is uh, one of the original uh, calculations in the birch swinnett and Dyer conjecture, where they were looking at, not at the L values, but by taking the Euler product up to some height, and then trying to make a conjecture for, uh, trying to make the birch swinnett and Dyer conjecture. But it turns out that if you take the Euler product up to some point, which is kind of like taking the, this side of the logarithm, right? And, uh, and if you do that, then you're off by a constant, and the constant, uh, like square root of two, yeah, it's which comes from, comes from this, yeah. uh, from this kind of phenomenon. And it also works with Dirichlet functions, because of the quadratic Dirichlet functions. Probably going in the other direction. Uh, so the proof of the moments of the zeta functions is conditional. Have you tried uh, doing it unconditionally? And how far you can... Uh... So, uh, well, I think lots of people have tried to do something unconditionally. We don't know, you know, we don't know, so it's, a, it's an interesting question, but we don't know, uh, we don't know how to get anything for, say, the four point first moment, or anything larger than four. So. So in some sense, the moment is kind of saying that, you know, suppose I ask you for the measure of the set on which zeta is bigger than v, right, unconditionally. So I, I, was, I told you Selberg's theorem, which says that this is going to be bounded by essentially t times something exponential in v, e to the minus v squared over something, right? Unconditionally, the only thing that we know about this is that this is bounded by t over v to the four, if v is large. So when v is in certain small ranges, you get better bounds. Okay? But in, in uniformly in a wide range of, of V, this is the only thing that you know, which is the fourth moment, which is the content of the fourth moment. So there is nothing that we know which will beat this large value estimate. If we knew that, we would actually have consequences for, say, gap primes and short intervals, uh, not bounded, not these gaps between primes, but every short interval containing, contains a prime. Well, B is large and no much better. Well, yes, there's a range in which you don't know, right? So if V is bigger than T to the one sixth or something, then we know the measure is zero, right? Right, but there's, there's some range, uh, maybe let's, let me say T to the 0.13, let's say. Then I don't think we would know. So V is T to the 0.13, I think. Uh, then we don't have a good estimate for what this measure should be. Right, so. So it doesn't have to be a large moment that we don't know how to handle. It could be a fairly small moment, which we still don't know how to handle. All right, uh, you'll ask a very ignorant question. Once you have on the moment, half ignorant. Uh, once you know all the moments, if you knew all the moments, what wouldn't you know? That is, I mean, if you had a compactly supported distribution, which this one isn't, certainly. Uh, then once you know the moments, you know the distribution. Of course, here we don't have something completely supported, and we will never know the moments exactly. We will just know someday unconditionally the main terms and some good error terms. But are there some interesting distributional questions that you that would not follow from a good knowledge of the moment? That would. That would that would follow, or that would. Not that would not follow. Because almost everything for, would follow if you need the moment to a high enough There's a motivation in part, I imagine. Well, I, I don't know if the moments, for example, imply pair correlation or, you know, uh, I don't see what, how it will. Yeah, well, that's very yeah. fine, yes. Yeah. It's not clearly implying maximal size. Uh, which is 
actually, I, I can make a precise conjecture on moments which would imply the maximal size. Really? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Root log. Yes. Root log. Yeah, to the root log. Just that, you know, well, I might as well say it rather than uh, be accused of having cliffhangers. So, so I, I conjecture that this is bounded by t log t to the k squared. Uh, if t is, let's say, bigger than a million or billion, let's say, and uh, uniformly in all values of k. Does this agree with the CFKRS conjecture? It agrees with the CFKRS conjecture. Yeah. You're sure about that? Yes. Yeah. Full lieutenants. Right. It agrees with the CFKRS conjecture. We'll take greater than root to one. Well, I said a, million, a billion, okay. but okay. Let's make it but not a billion, just to keep it safe. But, you know, but I think it might actually be. The point is that the constants that go in front here are actually very small. And so this is, in fact, a very weak conjecture that, to say. But if you knew this uniformly in all k, it would imply that the large values of zeta are really small. That would, but if you look at that formula, it's these secondary types. Yeah, yeah but, you can, yeah, but you can check that the formula satisfies this bound. So that I checked. Well, what would be an example? Again, it's an unfair question. What would be an example of something that would not follow, but that would not be local, like per correlation? Right? I mean, I mean, moments only control like large scale. Right. Yeah. And yeah. It would they control everything about it? No, I, 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 I think it's driven only by by the, by the very. Um, but he wants to assume it for uniformly for all k, right? So. For example, if you take the very small moments, then you will be controlling the size of zeta. So by looking at the very small moments and letting k go to zero, you will recover Selberg's theorem on, on the central limit theorem. So uh, it's, it's hard to say what can't be done. I mean, what reasonable answer can one give? Well, I think this Ramachandra conjecture cannot be done for moments, for example. So. Well, except if you take uh, complex moments, then you can, it can be done. But you need some uniform. What Harold is giving you. <laughs> I do not know, but well, all right. <laughs> what are the limit? You, you made some statement about them in some limit from Selberg use of small values. Yeah. What, are, what do you believe to be the, the limit of the Selberg distribution? Oh, so, so this is something which was worked out in uh, uh, Chris Hughes's thesis. And uh, uh, so, so roughly the idea is that if I, I, I'm doing this from memory, so you know, I'm not completely sure. So if V is, uh, so let's say V is like uh, minus log log T, and you're looking at values of zeta of size uh, uh, one over log T, something like that, then in that case, I think that there's a flip from uh, E to the minus V squared over log log T to just E to the minus V. Does that make sense? So, so, so instead of looking like E to the minus V squared divided by something, it just flips to, having something of size e to the minus v from that. There is no, yeah, we don't believe that there's a similar thing for large values. And this is simply because you get very close to a zero, and then those values are much larger than, than so if you're with an e to the minus v over log t of a, of a zero, then you have, you have a large measure. Something like this.